And the work that she's gonna show you is a part of her dissertation work, which was a part of um, an on-farm research uh, collaboration with USDA NRCS. And she sh also shares this interest in um, extension related work in, in social sciences and human dimensions of uh, decision soil health related practice adoption so she's going to share some of the work from um, that project from her dissertation research so turn it over to you Amanda yeah thank you for the introduction and good afternoon everyone thank you for your time and being here today I'm truly excited to be here sharing with you some of the learnings of this one of the last part of my PhD project here working with Andrew in the Resilient Cropping Systems Lab. So as this is my first time attending this conference, I am very uh, pleased to see all the exchange of knowledge and information that we have got and all the learnings through our shared experience. So I'm very thankful to be here today. So I want to start with this commonly used definition of soil health. Some of you might have already seen it uh, from USDA which is the continued capacity of soil to function as a vital living ecosystem that sustains plants, animals, and humans. So looking here, how soil is functioning or not, right? And we're seeing this picture I took from one of the very first sites that I visited when I moved to Nebraska. You see here a fence line separating two different soil management, right? Uh, and you see on the right-hand side, uh, crop residue on the left-hand side, cover crop during the winter time. So you see here uh, the soil having different uh, function expression after event. And you know that there was a rainfall event, you see some water here on the surface. So this might be an indicator that this soil, that part of the field might not be functioning as we would expect in regards to soil water cycling, right? But it's the same soil, just different management. So the point I want to make here is that Soil has its function, its inherent capability, but then the way we manage it and the land we use on top of it is that function expression of its health. And as you see, uh, I took that picture back in 2019 when I uh, moved to Nebraska, and you might recall 2019, um, we had flooding events, right? Uh, that created multi-billion dollars losses across this. So you're seeing here, uh, this video from Laura Thompson, the Platte River, we had numerous sites that had flooding that reached historical proportions, with even some sites breaking all-time record flooding uh, levels by even five feet. So uh, all those uh, events that happened in, in Nebraska are not only restricted to our state, right? So you see here uh, a map showing all different uh, weather events, uh, climate disasters that happen across the U.S. So, for example, last year we had 18 separate billion dollar weather and climate disasters that impacted uh, the, the country. So, when we uh, see this interest in uh, soil, health pro soil, health, soil health promoting practices and also in the context of uh, climate uh, and variability and or extreme sea water events. Uh, this brings uh, me to this analogy I would like to share with you. So I recently got some vinyl records as a birthday gift and I love it. Uh, but I remember growing up in Brazil and seeing my parents actually getting rid of their vinyl records. So why I'm saying that? Well. A lot happened when we think also about uh, soil health promoting practices, right? Those are not new. And actually, as a daughter of a history teacher, is it working? Okay, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, as a, a daughter of a history teacher, I have learned that many of those soil health promoting practices, they are not new. They are actually century millennial old practices. For example, you're seeing here cover crops, crop rotation, diversified crop rotations, right? So. Even though those practices they are not new, when we look at the ag census data, uh, we see that they are uh, the capacity or the adoption is very low, less than 14%, right? Of the uh, current U.S. land capacity uh, is adopting those practices and so how. So how do we promote the adoption of those practices among different uh, farming communities? So we need to start here with the awareness of the need, right? So if you were at the Lunchtime, we uh, we saw that everything started with awareness of the need. And you see here, farmers, they are the central players, the ones taking 
uh, management decisions on a daily basis. So how do we move from awareness to initial use of those management uh, systems, right? There are a couple of uh, conservation tools that are tools that can uh, promote conservation behavior. So for example, conservation incentive programs, we know that USDA is a leading funder uh, of programs that incentivize adoption of soil health promoting practices. There is also opportunities of on farm experimentation. So having farmers conducting on farm research in their own field and learning and um, sharing the knowledge and adapting from that, right? So farmers adopt those practices usually expecting some outcomes, right? That can be profitability, uh, resource use efficiency, resilient, draw resilient, there are different outcomes. And from a single management, we cannot expect the same outcomes because each farmer is different, right? And there are some intervening factors here. So for example, climate, geology, soil texture, duration, this will tell us from a single management what are some of the uh, outcomes that we can expect. And you see here duration as a factor. That means that we need to be uh, thinking how do we sustain these practices uh, on farmers' field because we are talking about practices that usually accumulate benefits relatively slow over time. So how do we make sure that farmers are sustaining or being persistent in adopting those practices, right? And there are a couple of research showing some of the pathways for persistence. As you see here uh, in this table, there are a couple of things that the literature has already showed us. For example, land owner cognition, sustaining motivations, habit forming, resources, and social influence. So all this is to set a stage for the motivation behind this work where we are collaborating with uh, Dr. Taylor Ruth in the Department of Ag Leadership Education and Communication Department, working on this framework you are seeing here that actually incorporates a lot of different so social science theories. One of them uh, we heard about during the lunch hour, diffusion of innovation. There are other theories that have been in place to understand how uh, we humans make decisions. And as Andrea mentioned, a very complex topic, right? So we have uh, come up with this uh, framework you are seeing here. So you see on top farmers affiliative network and social interactions, how that affect their values, beliefs, uh, intentions to adopt soil health promoting practices. Uh, and as you see here, that persistence of, or this adoption, which is something we are interested in, uh, what, what motivates farmers to continue adopting those practices in the long term. So we are using this uh, framework to address three main uh, research questions. The first one relates to the role of climate as a motivating factor for behavior. So for example, uh, the main question here, how experiences with uh, variability or extremes in weather facilitate or hinder farmers sustaining use of soil health practices? A second research question, the role of social and informational networks, how uh, they influence farmers sustaining use of soil health practices and finally, uh, how farmers respond to different communication interventions related to soil health. So uh, for the sake of time, today I'll be focusing on this first research question here. We are interested in understanding uh, the role of climate as a motivating factor for behavior. So this is a very uh, broad uh, explanation of all the data collection and methods. And I just wanna briefly emphasize here the population of this study, this qualitative research. So we are interviewing farmers uh, and we were interested in talking with farmers that were part of the USDA NRCS Soil Health Initiative. So this was a collaboration between UNL On Farm Research Network, uh, NRCS and farmers in Nebraska. So basically in 2016 and 17, a group of 17 farmers were uh, under equip contract with NRCS they uh, were part of this five-year on-farm demonstration. So basically, the farmers had the chance to select what treatment comparisons they want to test in their field. So usually a practice that was common to them and another practice that would uh, know to improve soil health. So in general, the majority of those farms included cover crops in some capacity. Some had uh, species rotate, uh, species selection, also uh, termination time, crop and livestock integration. So that is to say that each of those farms 
they were testing different things because basically the farmers uh, were giving the chance to select what they want to study. So we were interested in interviewing this group of farmers at the end of their five-year program, which was last year. So we, we interviewed eight of those farmers in semi-structured in-depth interview that were conducted on Zoom. Those interviews lasted between one and a half and two hours. We asked them a lot of questions. Uh, and uh, But I'm very pleased that they were uh, very engaged. And this is what I'm gonna show you today in terms of their results. So uh, how we present the results is in terms of themes. What are the main themes that emerged out of those conversations, particularly here, the role of climate as a motivating factor for behavior, right? So first, uh, I'm presenting three main themes here, and I will show some quotes that exemplify each of those themes, starting with past experiences. So farmers' previous decision-making in the context of variable or extreme weather conditions. There was also, when we talk about uh, the role of climate, farmers were weighting the costs and benefits of those different practices. So how they evaluate the benefits and drawbacks of soil health practices in the context of variable or extreme weather conditions. And finally, looking at the long term, right, that sustaining path that I mentioned we were interested in capture. So what are some of the identified factors supporting conti continued adoption of soil health promoting practices? So I will start with past experiences here, and uh, you will see there is a lot of text here, but I think each of those uh, quotes exemplify uh, really good what, what we were uh, what we were presenting here. So this first uh, two, I'm going to present two quotes here that were related to adaptive management decisions in the context of variable or extreme weather events. So you see here, this first farmer were actually describing a success that they had several years ago with a hailstorm in August. And that hailstorm basically damaged all the early seeded corn that the farmer had. And after the hailstorm, this farmer decided to plant cover crops. And it turned out that all that cover crop species that they planted, rye, cowpeas, brassica, rape, turnips, all came up. And by the time that the farmer uh, harvested the corn, uh, they, there was a great amount of biomass, right? Because that cover crop was seeded earlier than what farmer would normally do if it wasn't for the hailstorm. So this farmer took advantage of the cover crop biomass and added cattle uh, to graze that cover crop biomass. So as the farmer uh, described it here, uh, open quote, a total success on that. But it was because of the fact that my corn was damaged by a hailstorm and not for the hailstorm, I wouldn't have got that good of a stand and it wouldn't have been that tall by the time the cattle was in, or I would have had to turn the cattle a bit, a bit later. So financially, many times over that cover crop seed pay for itself, end quote. So this other farmer here describing some observations of uh, crop loss on a farm wetland when following big rainfall events. And this farmer even brought the conversation in the conversation that 2019 flooding event that I, I mentioned in Nebraska that happened in 2019, right? So because of that, uh, the water that sits on that portion of the field for very long during uh, big rainfall events, this farmer brought here that basically everything, everything turns to weed. So this farm has added cover crops and no tube and haven't had a crop loss since then. So as the farmer described here, open quote, I think part of that, my assumption is, they increase the infiltration rates and less runoff. So we have not lost the crop for the uh, past couple years. Same thing with nitrogen. We used to have nitrogen deficiency in a few spots and we have switched to side dress nitrogen a few years ago. Between, I think, infiltration rates and dressing nitrogen, we don't have a lot of nitrogen deficiency anymore either that we used to have in wet years on those wet areas, end quote. Uh, this other farmer here, uh, part of the Soil Health Initiative that I mentioned was going to study cover crop with brassicas in the mixture versus without brassica on part of that five year program, right? So there were some hailstorms, another farmer experiencing here hailstorms, which is common here in Nebraska, right? So 
Um, that cover crop that year that this farmer started this study basically got hailed off shortly after it emerged. And that particular year, uh, the farmer was going to have oats in their rotation. So the farmer was expecting to have greater cover crop biomass instead of just a little bit something after uh, corn, right? And this farmer described this past experience with on-farm ex experimentation coupled with conservation incentive program by sharing here, as you see, open quote, my personal trial was pretty much a failure because of weather. It was still beneficial to me because I was able to just take the risk and go ahead and try something. So I saw things and observed things that weren't really quantifiable and useful maybe to the study. But I took, it took some of that financial risk away to go to try something. But it was, it was part of what I learned. It was really hard to get a brassica to do any good or overwinter after a corner soybean. The time where we were going to really learn something was going to be after that cereal crop and it's pretty much wiped out by weather, end quote. And this other farmer here uh, sharing the learnings with cover crop and this So this other quote here, uh, the farmer is showing this constant battle uh, with the mother nature, right? So open quote, it's always a battle with mother nature. You try to control what you can and it's more, it's more to control. You try to do so many more things and mother nature says, no, it's not going to happen this year. Whether is it early frost, a hail storm, lack of water or whatever, it's always interesting. And I've learned a lot and I think there is so much more to learn with the biology and the soil. And that's what is really interesting now with the cover crops, end quote. So moving now to this second theme, uh, weighting the cost and benefits of each of those practices. Uh, first, in terms of challenge, right? Uh, in here you see in terms of establishing and terminating cover crops. Uh, so as this farmer shared here, uh, open quote, I would say limitations of cover crops can be either a dry year like this or a wet fall getting established or seed it can be an issue. Like this year, with it so dry, is it going to be any moisture there to get it started? Unless you are in an irrigated situation, and then is it worth spending the money on weathering and getting it established? Our climate here in general is a little bit of a limitation just because we are primarily corn soybeans and we use most of the season on those crops. I am not saying that we cannot make it work, you know, with some shortened season crops, end quote. And even though this can be perceived uh, as challenging, this other farm here uh, shared the importance of more intentional management decisions to make that cover crop work. So as this farmer shared here, open quote, cover crops are often looked at as they are taking the moisture away. Cover crops need to be managed and termination comes at different time each year. It is not by the book. And people tend to do it by the book and that's where they run into trouble. Just like using a lot of rye, you get a lot of nitrogen tied up. Cover crops have to be managed different, end quote. What about perceived benefits? Now we were looking at the challenge, let's look at some benefits. Uh, this farm here shared how uh, diversified crop rotation, especially here including wheat in that corn and soybean rotation, how that improved systems resilience to adverse weather conditions. So as this farm shared here, open quote, on the wheat part that I've, I've seen increased stock quality, which I was surprised I've never heard that before. So uh, the first year after wheat, my uncle texted my brother right away and said, hey, the stock quality on the corn after wheat, all these stalks are attached, you know, full. And the top of the stalks are breaking off on, the, on this part of the field, not after wheat. Stock quality could impact yield if you have a wind storm, end quote. So another uh, farmer shared the benefits of increased flexibility. So you see here this other quote, it is a challenge even today, looking out at the snow and wondering what is going to affect 
what is going to affect next spring? You have to have diversity in everything you do so that you are not totally wrong. You might be a little bit wrong. You are never going to be 100% right either. You have to be able to kind of play the average. You've got to be wrong sometimes, so you better have a backup plan built in that system. And benefits of those uh, long-term research in their own field, to see how they form in different uh, weather scenarios. Uh, and from a research perspective, we could think about, for example, cultivars adapted to a diverse range of conditions, uh, looking here at heat and drought tolerance, also plant days adjustment, maturity groups, how that affects pests and disease and weeds. So there are a lot of opportunities here to think about more uh, long-term research on farm, on farm sites. With that, I would thank you and I'll be glad to take any thoughts and feedback you'd like to share. Thank you. Great work happening here at the university. Um, her research focuses on the adaptive capacity of agricultural producers and others to cope with drought. Her research connects social science with climate science by informing the development of stakeholder-driven resources and tools. She's worked with ranchers, advisors, and researchers to develop the Managing Drought Risk on the Ranch website and has provided social science expertise to the development of climate decision, support tools for commodity, crop producers, ranchers, and specialty crop growers. Everybody, thanks. Thanks for being here this afternoon. Um, I'm really excited to be part of this discussion. Really excited with, by these uh, first two talks. I have lots of questions myself. And so I think my talk is really going to build on what Fernando was talking about um, weather and climate driving adaptation and decision making. And so, and, but then on the other hand, my talk's going to be a little bit different because my talk's going to be on the end of. For those of us who are working in the science world, who are developing information, who are developing tools, what can we do to help increase the likelihood that farmers and ranchers can actually use that information? So that's, um, that's so I'm just going to kind of flip the side a little bit from, from the farmers to the, to the information providers. So I want to start with, I appreciate the, the introduction to myself. Um, I have worked with the National Drought Mitigation Center since uh, 2009. Um, we are, our, our home here is here at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln, but we are a national center. Um, our mission um, is to help people, organizations, and institutions build resilience to drought through monitoring and through planning. So through monitoring, but also through management of drought. And um, because of our role on the monitoring side, um, uh, we are, we're producers of a significant amount of climate data, basically. We put out a lot of information, we put out a lot of tools. And uh, so I raised this, and, and I'll just, I'll point to just, if you're not familiar with the NDMC, if you are familiar with uh, something called the US Drought Monitor, then you have seen a product of the National Drought Mitigation Center. So, um, and, and, and there's some other tools up here that, that we work a lot with. Um, and, so we as a society, as well as farmers and ranchers, we are dealing, we are living in a very data-rich environment right now, right? Like we have data and information coming at us from all, all directions. Um, we're probably not lacking data. We may be lacking something we can actually use to make decisions, but we're not lacking data. And that, that kind of brings me to the point that just having an abundance of data um, like I said, if you go back to the mission of the NDMC, it's to build resilience to drought. Having all this data doesn't itself build any, build any resilience to drought. It doesn't really solve any problems. It's not until we take that information